Lies. <laughs> Everything you've heard today is a lie. <laughs> Everything I'm about to tell you is a lie. We all lie. I'm not even going to tell you how to manage risk growth. I can't tell you how to manage risk growth. You can't manage growth. Growth happens. The thing you really have to worry about is when it stops happening. Then you're probably all going to be out of jobs, whether you work for a vendor or an end user or a consultant. Developers lie. <laughs> all the time. They won't tell you how much storage they need. They won't tell you what the transactions are. I'll give you no idea. Business users lie. They won't tell you what the transaction volumes are going to be. They probably don't even know what the application is going to do and what the change is going to be. So we all lie. And to be honest, storage management and growth management has got really, really hard. At the beginning of this um, century, that is what we thought we were going to do. We were going to have a big unified array. Everybody thought that's where we were going. It was going to be easy. You're going to do your file, your block. Everything was going to come out of that device. As you can see, that's, that's probably a NetApp box. That's what everybody wanted to be. That's who everybody wanted to be. Unfortunately, things aren't quite that simple anymore. We've ended up with multiple silos. You can see you've got flash arrays, we've got x86, we've got EMC, we've got more flash arrays, this stuff called Amazon Web Services, we've got on-premises, we've got off-premises. It's just got hard. And how much growth? Well, we've all seen this. We've all seen this chart. Um, this is from 2012. It's probably worse now. 50-fold growth to the end of 2020. I'm not even sure it's going to be as small as that. But I do remember in about 2010, when I was first being presented with this kind of graph, I didn't believe it. I hadn't seen anything like this. I had a couple of petabytes of storage on the floor. It was growing a bit, but nothing like this. Yep. If you go back and look at the previous reports, not the yeah. 12 one, and look at the predictions they made for each of the years in that report, yeah. each time they were underestimated, and it goes higher and higher. We have no idea. Yeah. No, but, but you can't predict it. And there's so many things which people are talking we're going to change things. Big data, Internet of Things, unstructured data, structured data, virtualization, and who knows what's next. But as I say, I didn't really believe this graph until it happened to me. And it's interesting enough, it's normally just one thing of an application will come in and suddenly something will change. And when it starts, it doesn't stop. I don't know what everybody else's experience is. I mean, I've, do you see this growth? Do you actually believe this? Do you actually believe this is what we're going to see? Yeah? And it's interesting. So at one point, Managing a storage team, we used to talk about terabytes per head under management. We're now happily talking about petabytes per head under management. We're rapidly moving to tens of petabytes. I suspect by the 2020, we'll be talking hundreds of petabytes per head. There aren't any more storage administrators. There's not any more storage managers. So what the hell do we do? So we don't manage. We cope. Really? So it's all you can do. Lots of vendors have lots of pills to help you cope. GlaxoSmithKline have pills to help you cope. <laughs> but some of the vendors do. So we have things like data reduction technologies. So deduplication, compression. That will help. I know people who've managed to uh, put off buying storage for a year, 18 months, by just by implementing um, thin provisioning or compression. The problem with that is finance and think you're never going to spend any money again on storage. So when you turn up with them in 18 months' time, you say, actually, I now need a million pounds, two million pounds. Because the problem with storage is you're never asking for small amounts of money. 
They're like, hang on, you weren't spending any money. So they'll help, they'll slow things down. Automated provisioning and software defined storage. I, I, often I will actually uh, put these together. They're not going to help you cope with growth. In fact, they're just going to make it worse. <coughs> software defined storage, the ability for applications to provision their own storage. That means developers now have control of your environment. That's not going to be a lot of fun. Automated provisioning makes you, means you can actually provision the ship even faster. Um, tiered storage. Tiered storage is going to reduce your costs. That's all. You, uh, you might be able to make better use of SSDs. You might be able to move some stuff around. Utilization rates should go up. Um, your IO, you might make, at least you make sure you've got stuff in the right place. But yet again, that brings you back to the complexity. You end up with silos of storage all over the place. Data management. I think data management can easily be renamed. It's called deleting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll refer, refer you to the slide a couple of back. Lies. Nobody <laughs> deletes anything. It's always going to be useful. If you talk to users, it's really interesting. They, they really don't know what they're going to access again. Um, I'll, do some, I'll do refer to something which... So if I was to look at the archive I manage, we thought we'd get about 10% data retrieved, accessed. Um, turns out we were way wrong. In the past year, over 99% of the data we archived has been accessed by somebody. That's quite scary. But the thing is, once you start making these things available to people, they start using it. Martin, thank you. Are you a Hello. Yeah. Are you a peculiar use case for that? Because that's like mind-blowing, that 99% of I archive data. Yeah, so w w I work in media, so we're dealing with um, media files. I don't think we are that unusual. Thing is, it's really easy for our users to access that data. They almost have like a YouTube access to the data. They can get what they want. If you were to prefer YouTube for financial data or customer data, if you really want, if you have a marketing department who really want to start drilling down, I think you're going to you'll see that fairly rapidly. So does it happen because? Uh, they don't have a, um, an indexing or searching system? Oh, so no, no. This is, they have searching. They can access it. They can find it. That's the difference. That's what's made it different. And that is what is going to drive some of your growth. Once you have applications which allow you to use that data, people want to access that data. It's, it's, like, it's not chicken and egg. It's, yeah, it's just enabling. You're going to enable and your growth will continue because you've made it easy for people. So, so actually, I'm not going to delete any of that stuff. You've made it really easy for me to use it. So I'm just going to keep it forever. Drink. <laughs> <laughs> However, there's a bit of a serious point there. What do you do when you have a drink? You talk. It's very important for everybody to start talking to their users. Find out, explain the impact of growth. Find out what they're doing. Some of it will mean that you'll get more growth because you'll say, actually, you could do that. And they'll, they'll like that. But they'll also start to drop, oh, yeah, this is happening, that's happening. But not just your users. Talk to your vendors. Talk to your friends. Talk to me. I can help you with this. I can sort of at least give you some feeling that you can do this. I mean, so the environment I work in at the moment, we grow, we grow at two petabytes a month. I'm not putting any extra staff in to cope with this. Which you just do. You just cope. And actually, you thrive as well. Tools. Do you recognize those, Nigel? They're all <laughs> absolutely, they are horrible. 
I remember at an EMC customer council when a good friend of mine and a few other people know him turned around and said to EMC, ECC would be too expensive even if it was free. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's true. None of these things make things any better. You can see, to a certain extent, where your growth is. But things like ECC actually drive growth because they want more and more stuff. And I know EMC will shoot me because they don't use ECC anymore. It's Unisphere. It's, it's, just, it's just the same things. Yeah. yeah. Same crap in a different shell. And the problem is now we've got multiple silos, none of these tools will manage any of these or will manage all of your stuff. Um, NetApp will have a go with Sandscreen. Is Alex still in the room? Ah, oh, that's good. <laughs> Sandscreen was a product which had great promise when it was uh, owned by Anaro. Problem is, it's not really kept up and they can't keep up. There's just too much. I look around the room and there's so many startups. So none of these storage management tools are coping with this. So what do we do? How do we measure this? There you go. The two most common storage management tools in the world. Excel. And well, it's not really said, it's just shell scripts. So what we do is, or what my team have got, we've got a number of shell scripts. They generate reports. They email them to us. We, put them, we roll them up at the end of a month into a spreadsheet and we have a look and see what's going on. Uh, we read those reports. We're quite good at reading the reports. We look at them and every now and then we'll go and talk to the users and say, why is that happening? And normally, oh, oh. But we, you start to generate an idea of what's going in on your environment. You begin to know what's normal and what's unusual. So you can re-baseline things. It's getting that, almost that daily rhythm. Then look at the end of the month. Then the year. You'll get a bit depressed at times, because it's quite scary. But spending money on storage management tools, as far as I can see, it's just wasted money. But nobody's managed to do it in a good way. Pay as you grow. So that's one way of coping with this growth. So whether you're an OPEX model or a CAPEX model, vendors are getting better at this kind of thing. They'll over-provision storage for you, and you can pay as you grow. I think the most important thing, if you actually look, although if you go, people would say, okay, what's your problem? Growth is our major problem. It's not really the major problem. The major problem is actually being able to provision storage fast enough for your business to grow. If you were to talk to business users as opposed to storage or <coughs> IT people, they want you to be able to grow and cope a lot quicker. <coughs> Hans, in his presentation, talked about hyperconverged storage or hyperconverged. Um, Appliances. But it's important because actually, one of the most, as getting that on the floor quickly, getting new capacity on the floor quickly is hard in most enterprises. And um, from deciding you need something, you then going to RFP, if you're unfortunate enough to have to do that, then talking to procurement, then the inevitable procurement discussions. Then it gets delivered, then realizing you don't actually have the right data center space, then getting a vendor who actually insists they want it in their own rack. And you say, actually, I've only got standard racks, so it's got to be re racked. It, it can take four, five, six months to just get extra capacity on the floor. So if it's going to take you that long to get it on the floor, get the vendor to put more on the floor than you need, and then come up with a linear model. Well, obviously, this is all on premise. Uh, growth. This is a CapEx model as opposed to an OPEX model. Reality is, I think, with a lot of enterprises, certainly in Europe, we're not very good at OPEX. We want to spend money. We want to spend CapEx. 
And I haven't found a vendor at the moment who isn't willing to do this. Because they, they see it as some kind of lock-in anyway, because you've got the capacity, you're going to use it. Yeah. The other thing is just keep it really simple. I don't like snowflake features. I don't like it when a vendor turns up and says, I've got something really special. If it's that special, in two years' time, everybody's going to have it anyway. So I'd rather wait for that, because then I know it's going to come along the line. Most of the time, it's not going to enable my business to do anything. Uh, businesses just want to store the data. They're not that worried about features. GUI. How many storage administrators have we got in the room? A few? How do you configure your storage? GUI. See, this is the problem. See, there's a few people who think command line. The problem is, but when you've gone to a siloed environment and you've got lots of different types of storage, life just isn't long enough anymore. Well, you can prefer um, integration with the auto management places like vCenter. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Things, places like that, if you've got vCenter, um, if you, oh, some of the OpenStack stuff is beginning to, we're beginning to get common interfaces. Um, IBM, for instance, has done a fantastic job on their interfaces. If you, can, if you can manage one IBM storage device, you can manage all of them now because the GUI is identical. It just makes your life easier. The only thing I'd really say you do from a command line is go back to tools, is you learn how to script to get the information out to put it into your Excel spreadsheet so you can turn it into a pretty graph which you can show to everybody. Pardon? And troubleshooting. And troubleshooting. Most of the time you're not worried too much about that because you can get the logs. I know it's, it's heresy for a lot of people to say that, but it is. And back to developers. Push as much of your intelligence up the stack. Replication, Zerto do a great job. It's a wrong place to do it. <laughs> if you can possibly get the application to manage your replication, back up, anything like that, get it into that application layer. A, because, I mean, we all know storage replication. Storage replication gives you crash consistency. Crash consistency may not necessarily be good enough. You've got no guarantee that it's going to come up. And I've seen synchronous go horribly wrong where everything's are You've got corruption on file systems. You've got an FSCK on a file system which is 100 terabytes. Your, um, your recovery point has just gone into hours because you've just got to run an FSCK. If you can get the intelligence up the stack into the app, if you can run some kind of active active or something like that. For instance, I'm a great fan of DataGuard. If, you've got, if you're unfortunate having to run Oracle, don't be running synchronous app, uh, replication on your storage <coughs> array level. Try and run something like DataGuard. It um, means that you can do Heterogeneous um, replication as well means you don't actually have to have the same uh, storage array, type of storage array in each um, data center. So work with, the work with your application vendors, work with your own in-house developers, try and get all that put into the, the stack because it will just keep things simple. Because there's another thing, managing growth. As soon as you go into a replicated environment, synchronous replication like that, trying in a growing environment, trying to keep all those set up correctly so whatever you do there, you do there. And if you're growing at multiple petabytes a month, that starts to get hard. Truth. Truth is, as I say, you can't manage growth. Truth is, growth isn't a problem. Anybody tells you that growth is a problem, well, they probably ought to be looking for another job. Truth is, that will keep you employed. Truth is, sanity. It's pretty much overrated anyway. <laughs> um, and that's really it. It's short and sweet, but I think managing growth, everybody says it's the biggest challenge they've got. I don't think it is. I think coping with it, you have to cope with it, but you can't manage it. So learn to accept it, smile, have fun. And that's it. Your questions, comments, what's everybody else's reality? I know, but <laughs> again, thank you, Federica, thank you. 
Um, in the beginning, you said, I don't even have an idea how much is going to grow, right? How do you, you've coped with everything on a technology level. How do you cope with that on a budget level? On a budget level? Yeah, because you have no idea what you're going to spend on what, on which type of solutions. How do you, how do you financially make sure that you have the money when you need it? And um, you don't. You buy, what we end up doing a lot of the time is you'll get a budget at the beginning of a financial year. You'll have a guess. You've, you, you will have had a guess of what the growth is like. But generally, you don't... You, you, you squeeze it. You do whatever you can to cope, cope with that. Um, yeah, you budget. So you look at it. You can say, well, last year we grew by 40%. I might need this much extra storage. You find, if you turn around and say, actually, I'm going to run out of storage, the business will find money. It's an interesting thing. I mean, if you um, compute, you can probably cope with running slightly under capacity if you have to, it would, things start to slow down. Storage, yeah, if you, if you can't... Can you start deleting some files, please? <laughs> well, yeah. So that's what you do. You end up, you get in that situation where you're like, oh, can you do some data management? That's the other thing. That's the other way of doing it is you scare the crap out of the, your users every now and then and say, actually, we're now at 90% full. Please start deleting stuff. Else? Yeah, um, I have a remark uh, regarding your statement uh, pushing intelligence up the stack. Yeah. Um, um, at Google, um, that, that has been done, right? The up uppermost mm -hmm. layer was Big Table for a while. Yeah. And then stuff like Megastore started and um, uh, um, forks of that and so on. And Google actually, the lesson was there at some point, no, uh, we need to push that back in the infra infrastructure because application developers are really bad at distributed systems because it's a really hard problem, right? Um, and so uh, Spanner was born and um, the intelligence is back in the infrastructure level. Um, and you also seen that, that, um, the, the, that this is a really hard problem with um, there's this uh, guy who tests um, open source storage um, d database systems. Mm -hmm. after, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the, the tool is called Jasper, um, and um, he, he's finding uh, consistency problems all over all over the place, right? So that's a, a remote yeah, case I, 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 I get that, but it's actually quite good to actually get your developers at least to give it a go because at least then they'll realise that it is hard. <laughs> and and, and, and some, sometimes it's the case it's the application design. There's, there's a lot of legacy applications which you can't do it with, so you're going to end up doing it. Actually, as a side, I heard a much better word for legacy applications. Some of you described them as heritage applications. So instead of having a legacy, you've now got heritage applications, because it sounds better. Uh, can I actually get those scripts put in the storage array? <laughs> some time for some beer? It's actually, it will make your life easier. Get the scripts and... God, just give us the shell scripts. We're going to put them in a storage array and we'll give you some more time for in your... For your uh, okay. To have some beer. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 It, it, it will work, right? Yeah. It will, it will, it will do the reporting. Mm. Um, just, just a quick question. So have you ever looked at any information management or data classification solutions to um. help with some of those challenges? Because we have the same challenges that you're experiencing? You know, users doing what they want, not reviewing information, basically. Oh, yeah, so data them. classification, so everybody, I mean, that's been the, there are so many tools which people have tried to give to that. I know very few people who've managed to do it at any kind of scale. It works in quite small environments, but if you, as soon as you've got a large user base, we have it a lot harder as well, because a lot of people will do is, but what they do is they'll look for all the media files. And so actually, media files shouldn't be on those systems. It doesn't really work if you work in media. <laughs> <laughs> um, but AVI, yeah, that's probably quite important. Do you manage different types of data in different ways? Because obviously, in a way, you're a bit of a unique case because you have a yeah. massive media archive, and yeah. that can never be deleted. But lots of your crappy Excel spreadsheets that were written in 1992, they could be data managed because they're never going to do. Or is your solution, your, your um, 
you unique because if you have 40 petabytes, the 0 .000 whatever percent of petabytes that is your NTFS data that the rest of us care about is so small it's not worth worrying but about. There's, there's a bit of that, so that, that, that can be considered to be noise. But it's, it's, it's getting to a stage where Excel spreadsheets, they're not that big. There aren't that many of them. Another thing I would say, but a lot of people will turn around and tell you actually, uh, storage is now trending to um, to three. I mean, it's, I've heard people say you, you'll you'll get three storage. Um, problem is, if unless it's really three, when you start when you start working at scale, that three is still really expensive. But you, yeah, we there is data management. We do uh, we do get people to delete stuff. Uh, Excel spreadsheets, documents, th things like that. We, um, if, you, if I talk to my email, for instance, email's a good one. So that gets managed by quotas. Can I just add one thing into that, um, Martin? I, I've worked with companies where they've, um, they've built the, oh, put that down there. Um, they've built the, um, the, the use or the management of Excel files and other documents into workflow and process. Yeah. So you can't just go along and say, you don't need that anymore. You don't oh, yeah. need that in the right in a certain place, and you can't even move it around because they've embedded um, URIs and various links into the thing. So, very quickly, what you think is just a static store of data mm. becomes a workflow that people are using for their, their business, and that becomes a real problem too. Yeah, true. All, all, yeah, all these things mean that you can't really data manage, not in the way you think you can. I like the data manage is a synonym of uh, delete files. Yeah, I really like this. <laughs> I think that's the only way you, you, you will slow growth a little bit by getting people to delete stuff. I actually think YouTube store all around here. Um, I've always wondered if they're a waste of time to do it. If I just post that, you know, video. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so uh, the, the, the question is around uh, <coughs> YouTube's video storage, and if I just maybe post a video or, or, or something I filmed my kids playing or something like that, and we watch it once, we send it around the family, they watch it once, how long does that, you think that actually stays there? Does it stay there forever? And it, it will does stay. stay. Yeah, it, it, uh, it that's the impression there. that I get, that it, something it will forever. stay there forever. Yeah. So therefore, they must be in a similar situation to you. How do they manage what Wait. potentially a far greater Oh, yeah. Data have, management and storage issue than you have. We have a much bigger problem than we do. Yeah, I, I, they have a number of problems. For like, for instance, they have, obviously, they have copyright. They have um, unsuitable content. They have... Well, a, which is other issues, again. They have, they have a huge issue. But purely but from the data, yeah, well, storage, keep, and management. But, uh, they'll keep it for everything. They'll keep it forever. Yeah. So that, data, uh, that video you uploaded 10 years ago is probably still sitting there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, they'll, obviously, they migrate data, they move it around. It's sitting on um, shingle disks, very high capacity, both Facebook, Google. They have disks basically made for them. So that stuff will come down. So, so, so I was talking to a, a guy from Facebook uh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago. So that, that's where Cassandra came from. They, they wrote Cassandra to... So in his data center, he manages 75,000 servers. This guy, that, mm. that's all he does. And then if you think, you know, Facebook, not dissimilar to you, YouTube, all, all of these organizations, they're doing it themselves. So what they've got to try and do is make the cost of storage or the cost of their service as low as possible so that, you know, that, that's their baseline cost. And then any, you know, revenues that they bring in, they're still making a profit. So they accept that they're going to pay money for it and they're just going to make it as low as possible. So the, the hardware that um, Facebook buy is it's the ODM stuff. It's the manufacturer's that make for the likes of Dell and HP and all of the big name brands. And that's what I think a, a new thing that we'll see in the market a lot more. So for example, Quanta coming out of China, you know, they make stuff for the big name server brands. They're coming out as their own brand name now because they're having success with the likes of the Googles, the Facebooks, the, you know, the Amazons of this world. So they're kind of just all doing it themselves. Yeah. Which is just the, the part of it where which is just the part of it where it's the economy of that, but even just the, the scale of where do you keep it, do you just keep on building another data center, another data center, yeah. to just store that, that <coughs> video that I posted there 10 years ago and we've never watched it since. It's, it, it's, a, it, it's a strange kind of uh, issue. It's a, 
one, one, one more question. And that, and yeah. No, yeah. Uh, actually, remark on on the, on the cost structure there. Um, one aspect is uh, cheap hardware, uh, but the other is then scalable operations. Right yeah. at, at Google, you have. Um, two persons on call for the whole storage stack for all data centers in the world. And that works with automation. Mm. And um, the, the other important part is uh, the fault tolerance there. Um, anything of the hardware can fail, nobody has to run there. Um, the this, this, this stuff is all um, batch repaired. So people walk through the data center, um, just pull a machine out, uh, switch it off, because um, there's uh, failover techniques um, in place that reschedule the, the job or virtual machine on a different host. There's no maintenance windows, anything. So every, the whole operations is uh, decoupled in the end. And that's the important aspect there for the cost. Yeah, commodity is your friend of this. I mean, the ability to be able to do this and actually design for, for, design for failure. I mean, we could, uh, like the, the Netflix guys, when they came up for Chaos Monkey, which just randomly went round and broke things. That's, that's pretty cool when they would do it during the day. Unfortunately, they didn't factor in the fact that Amazon would do it for them anyway on Christmas Eve. So, 